Hello and welcome to our commentary on The Chosen. I'm Dr. Scott Heffelfinger and I'm joined here by Dr. Michael Barber, my good friend and my colleague here at the Graduate School of Theology at the Augustine Institute. So we're happy to have this time uh, together to talk about The Chosen Season 2, Episode 2, which has the title, I Saw You, a reference to uh, Nathaniel, who's going to be a major character. He's introduced here uh, in this episode. And one of the main themes um, that I just want to highlight at the very beginning, because it runs through the whole thing, is that the disciples are not defined by their past. They kind of emphasize this, right? And it's an important thing to emphasize because St. Paul, for example, talks about, you know, the old man and the new man. And so we want to recognize that there's this transformation that happens when we give our lives over to Christ through faith and baptism. Um, and it is a profound transformation, right? And there's a kind of, uh, in a way, a discontinuity with the past. We become children of God. Um, and at the same time, as I was watching it, I just, you know, one little note maybe of caution is, is a common sense one, and that is we should also recognize that our past, it, it does shape who we are in the present in, in some way, right? Especially in terms of our moral character. Um, and that's going to get lifted up in this episode in a different way. So I just want to keep both sides of the equation, so to speak, in view as we begin to uh, talk about this episode with this major theme that focuses in a special way on the character of Matthew and the various interactions that he has. Well, I mean, we see it with Matthew too, right? The fact that he doesn't know the scriptures like the other apostles do. So we see the way mm -hmm. that the past shapes who he is. Um, so that's interesting to see played out. Um, it's, Matthew is a fascinating apostle to me. And I do appreciate the opportunity that the chosen affords us to think through what would it have meant to have been a former tax collector? Right. Really yeah. interesting. But the, as you mentioned, the title, I Saw You, is really about Nathaniel. So let's talk a little bit about Nathaniel. In fact, let's begin with a clip. We have a little clip here where Nathaniel is talking. He's in a tavern, and he's basically explaining to the bartender uh, that he has undergone undergone a massive change, but he's speaking of himself in the third person. Let's let's take a take a look at this. He sounds like an ambitious guy. What did he die of? Hubris. It's me, by the way. I'm the dead man in the story. Yeah. Yeah, I got that. Just wanted to be clear. <laughs> so what did he die of? He died of hubris, hubris, his arrogance. I thought that was very interesting that they've taken this now uh, and run with a backstory for a disciple that we really don't know much about. So who is Nathaniel? Well, interestingly enough, he's never mentioned in the lists of apostles in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. We don't have the name Nathaniel as one of the apostles. Uh, he is listed with the disciples of Jesus in John 21. He is said to be one of Jesus's disciples. Uh, and fathers and doctors of the church have different opinions on this. St. Augustine uh, says that Jesus was just yeah. another disciple. He wasn't one of the 12 not apostles. Not Jesus, but Nathaniel. Wait, did I say Jesus? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Jesus is not one of the apostles. Well, he is an apostle. Okay, we're getting in uh, complicated territory here. All right, let me speak precisely. Augustine says Nathaniel wasn't one of the 12. Nathaniel was just another disciple. And yet there are those who have tried to suggest, well, maybe Nathaniel was one of the apostles. And here we can go to one of the slides here, guys. There are four apostles that are named in Matthew, Mark, and Luke who do not appear in the Gospel of John. Matthew, who has another name, Levi. That doesn't seem surprising to us. We know that Jews could have multiple names or different names. We know, of course, Saul and Paul. We know that refers to the same person, okay? James, the son of Alphaeus, he's not mentioned in the Gospel of John. There's also Simon the Canaanian and 
Bartholomew. He's mentioned in the list of the apostles, not mentioned in John. Now, what's interesting about this is Simon the Cananean has, for some people, evoked Cana. Now, this is based on bad etymology, but there are people who have identified Nathaniel with Simon the Cananean, or sometimes referred to Simon the Zealot. Of course, that's not the way the Chosen plays it out. Nathaniel and Z, as he's called in the Chosen, are different people. Bartholomew is an interesting case because Bartholomew is the one ap apostolic name that's not like a proper name per se. R literally means son of Talmai. So some people have suggested that if one of the apostles is Nathaniel, if Nathaniel is another name for one of the apostles, then Bartholomew might be the best bet for that. One of the things that is interesting is in Matthew and Mark and Luke, where you have the lists of the apostles, the name Bartholomew is closely linked with Simon. And in The Chosen, what we do see is that Nathaniel, okay, so let's say Bartholomew and Philip are linked together in the Synoptic Gospels. In The Chosen, Nathaniel is really close to Philip, has a friendship with Philip. So they might be playing on that tradition. We don't know. Uh, but it's just, it's worth mentioning. Uh, now, another thing we know about Nathaniel is, of course, the calling of Nathaniel in the Gospel of John. Uh, he looms large in the opening chapter. We read uh, in John chapter 1, if we go to the slides, Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Now, interestingly enough, some early church fathers thought, well, maybe Nathaniel was kind of an expert in the law because he's really interested. Or maybe Philip was an expert because, you know, there's this allusion to it, the one who's written of in the prophets. Mm, we don't really know too much about that. So we want to be, I think, cautious there. But what is striking is Philip then brings Nathaniel to Jesus. And when Jesus sees Nathanael in the gospel, let's look at what, what happens in the gospel, and then we can talk about what happens in the chosen here, okay? What happens in the gospel is uh, Nathanael's brought to Jesus, and if we go to the slide, uh, Jesus says to him, here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. And Nathanael asks him, where did you get to know me? How do you know me? How do you know that I'm without deceit? And Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. And Nathanael replies, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Now, scholars and interpreters have long puzzled over Nathanael's reaction here. I mean, it's one thing to say, wow, you really know me. And then Jesus says something about a fig tree. And Nathanael's like, oh, you must be the son of God. What's happening here? It's puzzling. It is a little puzzling. So there are different options. People have suggested different ways of interpreting this. Uh, some people have argued that maybe Nathaniel had been meditating under a fig tree. Jesus, I saw you under the fig tree. In the book of Zechariah, in the Old Testament book of Zechariah, we read a prophecy that says, I will remove the guilt of this land in a single day. On that day, says the Lord of hosts, you shall invite each other to come under your vine and your fig tree. And rabbinic tradition links meditating the law under the fig tree. So some people have suggested that what's going on in the gospel is that Nathaniel had been meditating on the scriptures. He had been under the fig tree. Jesus calls him. And what was he meditating on? Oh, well, why not Zechariah? <laughs> and so Nathaniel comes to Jesus and he says, you have no deceit, you know, no guilt in you. It's not the same word. Let's not, let's not, uh, fuss over the details. And so it's a fulfillment of this prophecy here. That's that's interesting. Other people have suggested that there's an allusion here to the story of Susanna, which is in the Greek version, the Septuagint version of the book of Daniel. In the story, there are two people who accuse Susanna of acting immorally and uh, they're liars. And Daniel figures this out. And the way he exposes their lies, he pulls them each aside and he asks them a question. Under what tree did you catch them? And they give different 
trees in their answers and they're exposed as liars. And so the idea of being under the tree, maybe that is somehow related to uh, being, re- being, you know, caught in your sin or being, re- you know, being convicted of sin. And so Nathaniel is recognizing he was repenting maybe somehow, somewhere. So there are different ways people have suggested. Now in the chosen, the way this is depicted as I think rather powerful. So let's go to the clip here in the chosen and, and see what happens when Nathaniel goes uh, and encounters Jesus. Hear my prayer, oh Lord. My cry come to you. Do not hide your face from me in the day of my distress. So in this scene, Nathaniel, this precedes his meeting Jesus. And so right. you have these different um, theories to account for the fig tree. And the way the chosen um, sets it up is kind of unrelated to any of them, right? <laughs> right. It just it has this story about Nathaniel the architect, and um, he's down on his luck, and he wanted to do this for God's glory. It's actually a very touching story mm-hmm. that, they, that they set up. And so under the fig tree, he, he burns these plans for a synagogue that he wanted to build for God. And it's sort of like, you know, God, where are you in mm-hmm. this moment? Do you, do you see me? Do you know what I'm going through? And so mm-hmm. this is the prelude uh, to the to the call that's going to happen. And I love when Nathaniel is referring back to this scene when he's talking in the tavern to the kind of bartender figure there, he has to make clear, like, that story is about me. Just so you know. <laughs> right? And this is a constant theme in The Chosen where the man in whom there is no deceit, Nathaniel's always got to, like, wear it right on you know, <laughs> right. his sleeve, right? And he's got to say what he thinks. Um, and it's it becomes this kind of amusing thing. But so this is how they set up the fig tree, another story to account for it. Sometimes I think, you know, the simplest explanation is is maybe the best one. I think Jesus just likes figs. That's really <laughs> what this comes down to. Um, but no, not, not really. So this gets set up in that particular way. Um, there's also a powerful portrayal of something that we see in, in the Old Testament, in Job, for example, of repentance and ashes. Yes. And so there's a neat way that they incorporate this into Nathaniel's story as well. Let's take a quick look at that clip. So putting ashes on your head in biblical traditions can mean lots of different things. It can refer to mourning, and that's fitting here because, of course, he's mourning now this lost dream. But we also know that he's going to say that he died of hubris. And so there's another aspect of wearing ashes that Catholics are familiar with, especially from Ash Wednesday, that is you put on ashes as a sign of repentance. And so when he goes into the the tavern, he is expressing some repentance over his hubris. And I think it's really powerfully set up here so that when he does ultimately meet Jesus in the chosen and Jesus in the chosen identifies him as a man in whom there is no deceit, that may be a reference to the fact that Nathaniel had been already experiencing the grace of repentance. So he's already been led to repent, and now he's set up to encounter the risen Lord. And one of the things that, uh, not the risen Lord, but encounter the Lord. And one of the things that I like about this is the way Jesus's divinity also seems to be emphasized. Let's go to clip five. What is this? How do you know me? 
I have known you long before Philip called you to come and see. Don't look at him, look at me. When you were in your lowest moment, and you were alone, I did not turn my face from you. I saw you under the fig tree. Rab. So after, you know, Nathaniel's been down on his luck, he's repented, he's wondering where God is in all of this. Does he see what's in his heart? Does he see what he's done? Does he see what he's going through? And then Jesus comes along, and as he calls him, he affirms that he saw him, right? Mm -hmm. He did see what was going on and saw him under the fig tree. And so it kind of ties these together in a pretty powerful way. And the one he was praying to is Jesus. That's so powerful, and and when the I, I love the way they depict this. The acting was very powerful. As soon as Jesus says, "I saw you under the fig tree," you just see it hits Nathaniel who it is that he's talking to. Yeah, I, I think that's a it, it's a very powerful portrayal. Now, of course, we read about Nathaniel. Let's talk a little bit about the other major character, the other the apostle who gets much of the focus in this episode, and that is Philip, all right? Now, Philip appears in uh, a number of scenes in the Gospel of John. We know Philip was from Bethsaida, like Peter and Andrew. Read about that in John chapter 1. And of course, in The Chosen, Philip says he knew Peter when they were living in Bethsaida, and there, there really isn't much explanation of how Peter came to live in Capernaum. We don't get that in the Gospels either. We don't know how they moved there. Archaeologists have shown that what happened was in Bethsaida, it was originally sort of a Jewish area. And then you have Philip, uh, who is a Herodian ruler, starting to build out that area, and it becomes much more pagan. And so it seems that many devout Jews left that area and moved to Capernaum which is interesting. Um, Capernaum comes from the Hebrew word uh, Nahum, which, Nahum, which means comfort, right? So it's a place of comfort. You move to Capernaum after you've been exiled in a certain sense. Anyway, uh, and in The Chosen, Philip is described as one of the disciples of John the Baptist. Now, this is somewhat surprising because we don't explicitly read that Philip was one of John the, uh, John, the, uh, Bapt uh, John the Baptist's disciples in any of the Gospels. We do know that Andrew was there with John the Baptist with another disciple who's unnamed, and so that could be Philip. Um, and we do know uh, that Andrew is linked with Philip elsewhere, so it makes sense for the chosen producers to say, well, if there's another disciple who, like Andrew, is following John the Baptist, it, it could be him. Uh, what do we know about uh, Philip from the Gospel of John? Well, really, there are four scenes involving Philip. Let's go to the slide here. Uh, the first is the calling and invitation that we just talked about in John 1. Then in the feeding of the 5,000, Philip plays an important role. Uh, and then we also read in John 12 that Philip is approached by Greeks. Of course, that's significant because Philip has a Greek name himself, and that's alluded to in, in the Chosen series. Uh, and so it would have been natural for Greeks to come and say, well, what's your name? Philip. Oh, good. <laughs> you can help us, right? And now, are these Gentiles or are they Greek-speaking Jews? That's not immediately clear. There's been a debate about that. And then my favorite scene involving Philip is at the Last Supper, Philip asks Jesus, show us the Father. And Jesus says, well, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So those are the major episodes in the story. Uh, and what I, what I found interesting is the way in this episode, Scott, uh, Philip is making a concerted effort to help Matthew be better accepted by the other apostles. Uh, I thought that was intriguing because it does seem like, for example, people like uh, the Greek-speaking people in John 12 come to Philip. Philip maybe is a bridge builder there in the Gospels, and so maybe that's 
what's forming this imagination in the chosen uh, or in the minds of the chosen? I yeah, he he just seems to have a pretty jovial character, and the, and yeah. one way that this kind of gets um, portrayed in a thematic way is the idea that Philip has the most experience with mm -hmm. this kind of being a disciple thing, yes, you right. know, and and maybe the idea is from that experience he knows the importance of. Um, keeping groups together, right, and respecting mm. each other. And so it, it's true. It's, it, he, he sort of um, shows kindness to Matthew, mm -hmm. which Matthew is not accustomed to at this point. Um, and what I think is um, a neat insight or a neat touch here is that Matthew responds to that. You know, we all respond to kindness, to love, right? And so Matthew responds to that and kind of draws close to Philip and, mm -hmm. and wants to to learn from him, mm -hmm. right? And he even has a line about how Philip likes me, you know, which is not something he's used to. And uh, I mean, as a former tax collector, right? Um, and so, and then the problems that he has with, with Peter and the, the, the kind of baggage that he brings with him from being a tax collector. Um, so you have this way that they, they share uh, a friendship. Um, and that comes out, like you said, I think it comes out mm -hmm. uh, really nicely there. Um, you know, another little touch that's kind of fun is we we see at different points some jokes that surface about <laughs> Nazareth, for example, reference, right. and then you know um, about Peter's lack of running ability, which of course seems to be setting up uh, post resurrection. You know, way way further ahead, um, Peter running to the grave and being the slower of 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 the of the two going to the tomb. Um, Philip's so kind funny. of speaking in riddles to Matthew, and he explains, I don't really know what you're talking about. I'm not following you. And Philip's, oh, yeah, well, when you're hanging out with a guy like John the Baptist for a while, you can become a, a bit accustomed to speaking yeah. cryptically, you know. So, yeah, there were some amusing scenes there. I had some questions about some of the portrayal there involving uh, scenes where Matthew's talking to Philip. Uh, Philip and Matthew gets to know each other, and Matthew explains that he skipped ahead in school. And you get the sense that all Jewish boys went to school, and they started with religion, and Matthew skipped ahead somehow and advanced to math. And um, there, there wasn't really a, a school system like this in Jesus's day, so this is a little bit anachronistic. Uh, but I think, you know, I don't want to dwell on all the little things, the one thing that really stood out to me, Scott, were the mixed messages on institution. Yeah, this was, this was kind of puzzling. We have a couple of clips that set this up. Let's take a look at the first clip uh, here. Yeah. I just don't know what he sees in me. He's a religious teacher, and I know very little about religion. From what I understand, Jesus doesn't love everything about religion. So, you know, what, what Philip says here, you know, from what I understand, um, you know, Jesus doesn't love everything about religion. And, and we've kind of talked before about the idea of just religion in the abstract. That, that's pretty foreign, I think. To... Definitely. <laughs> and any historian or scholar today would explain that the whole concept of religion is like the separable thing that is distinct from culture is completely anachronistic here, right? The, it, religion wasn't uh, this separable category from the rest of your life. Right, and so the, the kind of net takeaway from this first clip is, you know, religion brings with it kind of institutions and traditions and structures, and Jesus is not happy about all that. And that's that. really what religion involves. Religion, right. I, you know, I'm I'm spiritual, not religious. You get that all the time in our yeah, culture So that's getting today. imported a little bit. and. We're not so keen on that, but it's not even consistent exactly. Let's take a look at another clip mm -hmm. that is a different side of the coin. One day, Simon, there will need to be more structure. And I see you playing a big part in it. Out of all humility, Rabbi. Why not now? Why not more structure today? Because I am still here. Yes, of course you're still here. Are you saying one day you won't be? It's a conversation for another time. But we will talk about it. I think so. So here it's, one day there will be need for more structure, and I see you playing a big part in that. Now, of course, there's something um, 
wonderful about this, right? Peter's role, he's the prince of the apostles, you know, and um, first pope. So I like that affirmation, right, and that kind of seed being planted. Um, but it's sort of like what you give with one hand, you take with the other mm-hmm. here, and you're left, like, well, well, what is it? Is, is it institutions are bad or actually we're going to need them? Um, it just is a little bit hard to make sense of these. And you get gestures. the sense that Jesus doesn't think there should be any institutional structure until after he's gone. And it's just an absolute necessity. Oh, then we're going to have to deal with having institutions and organization and structure. Uh, but, but of course in the gospels, we see that Jesus goes up for the festivals. We see that Jesus participates in the temple rites. He tells the leper that he needs to offer sacrifices as it's described in in the Torah. We see that Jesus wears tassels and Jesus is very much, as Thomas Aquinas says, conforming his life to the to the law of Moses in every possible way we see there in the Gospels. So, um, so there's one more scene. Let's go to the last clip. Uh, the last clip here where, um, oh wait, let's see. Is that right? Do we have a clip for that? Um, well, I, I will just, I, I'll just mention it here. The idea that Jesus is going to um, somehow down the road blow up all the complications that Jews have, right? And we see that in a, in a couple other scenes. But uh, so this whole idea of do we need religion? Do we need institutions? Seems a little inconsistent and almost seems like the structure of the church is like a, a necessity or a, it's a, an afterthought almost. Yeah, and, and I think the main thing is throughout the Gospels, and this is what I think you're getting at, Michael, throughout the Gospels, Jesus only shows appreciation for the institutions in place, right? That's right. He is certainly critical of some who occupy those institutions and their actions. Or the way some of those institutions are abused. Right. But it, that, that's a very different thing than sort of um, coming down on the institutions themselves. So, you know, it's just a theme to kind of watch and to, to pay attention to. This kind of comes out of a Protestant perspective that oftentimes pits personal faith against tradition, institutions, offices, things like that. And I mean, of course, you can believe in institutions. Jesus will say, scribes and Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, therefore do whatever they tell you. Just recognize that they don't always practice what they preach, Jesus goes on to say in Matthew 23. Um, Something else that we might want to talk about is that Jesus approves of Matthew writing things down. Even though Peter recognizes that this can also introduce some difficulties to have a written record of the things Jesus does. Let's take a look at uh, clip number eight here, guys. In the short time that I have followed, people have quarreled over things Jesus said, remembered things differently, and disputed his meaning. I think it's best we have a written record to refer back to. Everything he says and does? Yes. That's not a good idea. Why? We have enemies. There are people trying to trap Jesus in his words. They could twist something he said to defame him. Have you thought about that? They will find it easier to twist something he has reported to have said than if it is confirmed in writing. That's not how the world works. People can twist words however they want. But it's clearly written. Yeah, I bet as clear as the last time I saw you writing in your journal, spying on me for the Romans. So there's this motif that we constantly see in The Chosen. Jesus is going to get himself in trouble, and Peter's going to protect him. Peter's looking out for Jesus's best interest. You know, Jesus, you really haven't thought this through. I can see some issues coming down the down, down the line here. You know, we need to make sure there's a back alley of this house so we can get out if we need to. And, you know, I don't see this Peter at all in the Gospels. I'm constantly amazed when Jesus expresses to the apostles for the first time that he's going to be handed over and killed. Peter, God forbid! What? This is not going to happen. Of course this isn't going to happen. You'll get the sense that Peter has been looking out all the time for ways that Jesus might end up getting himself uh, in, in hot water. Uh, but I do appreciate that the chosen producers are recognizing something that's very real here. And that is, if Matthew writes down the things Jesus says, people can misinterpret them. And in fact, there's an inherent danger in being a teacher. 
I know this. Scott, you know this. We, we're both teachers. And one of the problems that you have when you're a teacher is that you can have students who say, well, you know, I heard what Dr. Heffelfinger said, and he said this in a class. That's not what Dr. <laughs> Heffelfinger said. Whenever you, whenever you expose yourself as a teacher, uh, whenever you take the position of the teacher, you expose yourself to possible misinterpretation. And of course, that's the case with the Gospels being written. Even though the Gospels are written down, it doesn't mean that all possible objections are resolved. In fact, the fact that we have four different Gospels that are written from four different perspectives uh, often creates difficulties uh, in interpretation. So, Yeah, and, and in this scene, too, um, there's a kind of back and forth mm -hmm. um, where you know, there's a disagreement. Is it, what's the riskier thing, right? To leave mm -hmm. the words, just, this is what he said. And you paraphrase, right. Or to actually write it down, you know? And so one of the kind of neat things here, it leads us into, or back rather to this theme of the disciples each bring kind of their own background and their gifts. The mm -hmm. past, it's not, it, it's not all decisive, but it does matter. And so Peter, from his past, is you know has a particular worry about the danger of writing these things down, and he's trying to protect Jesus because that's at least how he's portrayed in the Chosen, right? This kind of protective um, planning kind of guy. Um, Matthew, on the other hand, from his past, he's a tax collector. He's very focused on figures and details, and he wants to have a detailed, precise account. Um, and so he's he's writing it down. Um, we see we talked about Philip, right, bringing his experience and maybe from that caring for Matthew in a particular way. Um, we see in other contexts Peter's natural charisma as a leader and mm -hmm. Jesus acknowledging that. So, you know, I think this is helpful for us to see that um, again, our past doesn't determine everything, but the positive way of thinking about the past is that, Everyone has a gift to bring, and God in his providence has shaped our trajectories so that the, the experiences and the gifts that he's given us can contribute to the new life of discipleship uh, when we come to follow Christ. And so this comes out you know, in a few different ways um, in, in The Chosen. One, one thing I'd like to just piggyback on there is that point that we all bring our own gifts, and that also applies to the gospel writers themselves. They bring their own gifts. And in the Chosen's depiction, you almost get the sense that Matthew thinks he's writing down exactly what Jesus says verbatim. When we read the gospels, we know the gospels, especially in Greek, they, there's no quotation marks in Greek, and there's no red letter edition in the ancient manuscripts, right? Basically in Greek, it says, Jesus says that. And basically what they present to us is the substance, as Augustine would say, of what Jesus said. So if you read the words of institution of the Eucharist in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and in 1 Corinthians uh, 11, you'll see that th the words aren't exactly the same, right? And, and so I wonder a little bit about... Uh, about the way it's being portrayed here and the mindset. It, I don't think Matthew thought, and I don't think the evangelists thought they were writing down exactly what Jesus said, but they are bringing their own gifts as God has given them insight into the meaning of Jesus's word. So, you know, in Matthew's gospel in the words of institution, Jesus refers to the blood of the covenant, which is a direct allusion to something Moses says in Exodus. And here we see Jesus is establishing a new covenant, right? That in, um, Luke and Paul, Jesus says, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. The phrase new covenant, not found in Matthew and Mark, but it points to Jeremiah's prophecy of a new covenant. So it's not that one is contradicting the other, but we, we see how the different gospel writers are bringing their own understanding of the implications of Jesus's words and actions to the table in writing the gospels. And so I feel like oh, it would have been nice to have maybe emphasize that a little bit more in terms of Matt, what Matthew's doing rather than just as a stenographer, right? Yeah, I wonder, you know, it will be interesting to see. Maybe um, I could imagine Matthew kind of loosens up as things oh, go on. And, and maybe that would then color the sort of final form, you know, of, of his gospel. We'll so, see, although knows, although, although in the first episode of the season, when Mary, when John is talking to the different apostles, Matthew, well, mine will be very precise, yeah. you know, yeah. as opposed to yours, which is not going to be precise. <laughs> which is, okay, that fits the character of Matthew in The Chosen. Yeah, but, you know, one of the things, let, do, we want, do you want to introduce the last clip here? I think we have yeah. one last point and we wanted to make Yeah, here. so, I mean, we see the... Um, these these gifts that the disciples have uh, relevant to the life of discipleship for all of us. Um, I like, too, that they present the, the kind of challenge that the disciples are having uh, in these early mm -hmm. days. And so let's take a look at that clip. 
Did I sleep late? The sun is hardly up. Oh, my back. <laughs> it gets easier. A little. You get used to it. Are you packing? I am. I pack every morning now. I never know if we'll be somewhere for a night or a week. That sounds hard. I didn't think about how this would really work. I think everyone's struggling with that. In some way. So in the previous episode, we saw Rama beginning to follow Jesus, and she's giving up her sort of previous life to, to become um, a disciple. And then here she is thinking, you know, I, I didn't really know how this all will work. And Mary Magdalene, in a way trying to console her, but also to be you know, realistic, basically says that, you know, everyone is struggling in some way. And I think beyond here, it's, you know, they're sleeping outdoors, and she wakes up, and it's kind of like, oh, my, you know, I've got a crick in my back or whatever. Um, and... Uh, of course, that has its own set of challenges, but there are all sorts of challenges, I think, that apply to all of us. And so I like this scene that everyone is struggling in some way. And it's not only because they're sleeping outdoors, right? It's not only because of this, that, or the other thing. You know, for example, um, it's a constant challenge, I think, to set aside that time for prayer. You know, mm -hmm. it's a challenge to um, commit to following Jesus in every situation with all of our heart, mind, strength, soul. Um, there are all these different challenges uh, that, that the disciple faces, and they're not just at the beginning. Um, and this is, I think, one of the rich uh, dimensions of the Catholic tradition of spirituality in the interior life is um, there are moments of abundance, absolutely, in the spiritual life, but there are also always moments of challenge. It's mm -hmm. not like you just leave mm -hmm. it behind like, well, I got used to sleeping outside. Now my back is stronger, you know. Um, no, uh, we've got to seek time for prayer. We've got to seek out the sacraments. And Jesus himself, you know, demarcates and sets aside time to go off by himself and pray. So this, I thought, was a, a helpful reminder that the life of discipleship is one that always has uh, constant challenges. Um, so I appreciate that about the scene. And, you know, just kind of looking back over the whole of this episode, and again, this theme of the past and how it mm -hmm. uh, shapes the present, how it's transformed, you know, I think it's helpful for all of us to think about what are our gifts, you know, what are the challenges that we face, um, what are those real difficulties and discomforts that we face in our own lives of discipleship? Um, because to name it, you know, is sort of like the first step to, in a way, appreciating it as a gift to grow closer to the Lord. Um, and so these themes of our past, our gifts, um, following Christ, are highly applicable, I think, to the ordinary life of discipleship. So these are some of the thoughts we had taking a look at this episode. We hope you've enjoyed them. Uh, we hope to see you back as we continue our trek through The Chosen, offering this commentary in the hopes that it will enrich our lives yeah, and back to Scripture. If you're watching this on YouTube, I want to encourage you to, to like it so that Google, YouTube knows that people are interested in videos about the Bible. That, that would help the Google algorithm a little bit there uh, So uh, to evangelize. Um, so anyway, thank you. Evangelize Google, I guess. There we go. Thank you so much. <laughs> Take care and God bless you.